people. All right, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm very excited about this panel. This is some, this holds a special place in my heart and uh, I know so many other people's. Um, so wel welcome everyone to more talks. Uh, my name is Michael Orr, I'm your host, and we are going to be sharing another more talk today from Thomas More University, where we present short, powerful talks devoted to spreading ideas, thoughts, and information to our community. I'm very excited to introduce you to our panelists today. Uh, joining us, we have Tim Perino, Executive Artistic Director at Cincinnati Landmark Productions, and Maggie Perino, who is the Theater Director at the Carnegie in Covington, Kentucky. Thank you both so much for joining us. And Lynn, it looks like you've, you're joined as well. Yeah. Hello. Uh, we are also joined uh, by Lynn Myers, who is the Producing Artistic Director of the Ensemble Theater in Cincinnati. Thank you all so much for joining me. I'm, I'm very excited to have you with me today. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi. Thanks for having uh, us. Yeah. So if we want to start out and just uh, give a brief introduction, uh, I would love to hear from each of you. Tim, if you wouldn't mind starting. Uh, yes, my name is Tim Perino, uh, director of Cincinnati Landmark Productions. Uh, we took that name years ago because at the time we uh, operated a young people's theater out of Westwood Town Hall, which is something of a landmark, and the Showboat Majestic on the Cincinnati Riverfront, which is a national historic landmark. Uh, since then we've also, although we eventually left the showboat, we are now operating the Warsaw Federal Incline Theater, the Covedale Center for Performing Arts, and the Madcap Education Center and Madcap Puppets out of West Point. Wonderful. Uh, Lynn, would you mind giving a short introduction? Uh, sure. Uh, run Ensemble Theater, which is in the middle of Over the Rhine, Gateway to Over the Rhine, and uh, theater is going into its 35th season next year. Uh, it's a theater dedicated to new work and work new to the region with a social conscience. So uh, it's been a very challenging time lately, uh, but, uh, but an exciting time uh, to be in our city and share so much history with, uh, with Tim. We both went to Thomas More, so there you go. He was in the very first play I ever directed. He's a wonderful actor who tends to not tell people that, but I'll tell it on him. <laughs> <he's really> good. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. And Maggie, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure, yeah. Uh, so Maggie Perino, I'm the theater director at the Carnegie. Uh, we're in the East Side neighborhood of Covington um, on Scott Boulevard, if you're ever down that way. Um, I am also an alum of Thomas More, but I did my master's there. I graduated in 2013 from their master's in teaching program. Um, I have a certification in theater, teaching theater. Um, and yeah, the Carnegie is a really, really neat kind of community organization space. Um, we utilize the arts sort of as a, a community building tool. Um, I like to say we, we have a theater, we aren't necessarily always a theater, right? We have a lot of programming going on um, and a lot of it is of equal sort of mission, importance, education, art gallery, stuff like that um, of the theater. So it's really a neat sort of interdisciplinary space. Um, sort of fun fact, my undergraduate degree is actually in philosophy of interdisciplinary studies. So it's a perfect place for me. I love being where sort of lots of um, ideas and creative experiences can, can meet at a crossroads and, and how we can kind of serve people that way. Wonderful. It really is a fantastic space. And uh, so are all of your spaces. I, I'm a big fan, to be perfectly honest, of all of your work. Um, but we are here today uh, to talk about the arts and how they can transform our communities and how they are currently transforming themselves. Um, I've got, I, I reached out to people across arts communities to ask for questions, and uh, I got a huge amount of responses. Uh, so I don't know if we're going to get to address everything that I have today, but I'm very excited to talk about even a few of these questions. Uh, I want to make sure our audience knows that this is being recorded, so you do have the opportunity to view this later and to share it with friends and associates. Uh, I also want to let you know that if you have questions that you want answered as we go through this talk, please feel free to submit them in Zoom's chat function as well. I would be more than happy to moderate those and uh, make this talk as relevant as possible to our audience. So uh, with that in mind, let's get ahead and get started. Uh, the first question I have here is, um, what do you see as the role of the arts in shaping or participating in local communities, particularly in the greater Cincinnati area? Uh, how do you see the, the arts shaping our communities? Who wants to go first? <laughs> you go first, Tim. Oh, you go, we'll, we'll alternate, right? <laughs> yeah, right, thanks a lot. Um, well, you know, I, honestly, uh, uh, very, very much, uh, we think of our 
venues. We have one in East Price Hill, one in Price Hill, West Price Hill, and one in Westwood. And we we really believe in in their and even like Arts Waves uh, mission of of the vitality that you know performing arts or arts in general bring to a community. It, it it's not just about you know going to the theater, but it's all the things around the theater and and a source of pride, a source of uh, identification. Um, uh, you, know, I, I mean, you know, nobody's got that in more than Lynn's, you know, situation down where Over the Rhine was yeah, at one time a place that was identified maybe in, in a not so positive way. And, and the person who hung on and the persons in the organization that, that really, you know, was the, one of the original sparks down there was Ensemble Theater. Um, we're the same way in places like East Price Hill uh, or, um, or, you know, Glenway Business District or right there in the heart of Westwood now, which is in the middle of a kind of a neat rebirth as well. And we're part and parcel to that. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not, it's historical, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's current, it's right now. You know, I, years ago when I was, we were trying to get a, a grant to help uh, fund the creation of the Incline Theater, uh, we had a, a, a funder say, you know, that someone came to them and said, hey, uh, I'm so glad you're doing this because it's gonna bring back Price Hill. And I said, full stop right there, I'm not interested in bringing back what Price Hill may have been. I'm interested in what it is today, the people who are there today, and its future. Because if we're gonna be here, we are part of that future. That's what theaters are, in my opinion, uh, or performing arts, or arts in general in a neighborhood. You are part of that neighborhood's future. And uh, I think you bring a lot of benefits to that future. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think what Cove Dale, uh, just watching that transformation of, you know, cars going into the Cove Dale as opposed to driving past is awesome. <laughs> you know, it's like, I always know when there's a show because I go past it every day and it's uh, it's exciting. And, and like Tim was saying, I, I mean, one of the things is we are really unique because of where we are. I think the shows we do, I think that the programming we do, we would be very different if we were theaters anywhere but in our area. And, you know, being in Over the Rhine and, you know, this theater founded 35 years ago by brave, smart people who's like, you know what, we'll, we'll buy a, a, a building in a, in a block nobody wants to be in. And, um, and they made a real investment in, in deciding to hire local professionals to work here. And also, you know, just a really strong investment. People didn't want to cross Central Parkway. They just didn't. And, um, you know, everybody knew what happened once you got up the hill to UC and everybody once you knew what, what happened after you got past Central Parkway. But uh, being right here at the gateway to over the Rhine, we, we choose our shows by the news. You know, we, we listen to what people are talking about. Uh, we care about what's happening in the community. In the early days, when I first came back here, uh, we were a latchkey operation so that I saw all these kids walking around after school. They didn't have anywhere to go. And there were kids that were, you know, seven and eight taking care of four-year-olds and stuff. So we just opened up the doors and they'd color in the lobby. You know, it's like watching outside the door and seeing what's going on. Now with the renovations, luckily we've got glass in front so we can see it a little bit easier. Uh, there were bulletproof doors uh, before that. So uh, it wasn't very inviting. But, um, but yeah, you can make a difference. And even today walking in, uh, the people next door at Taste of Belgium were like, when are you guys gonna open? Because, you know, it really stinks for the businesses down here. You know, if we're bringing in 1200 people a week or not, that's a big driver. And I think that um, that's certainly true of, uh, of the Carnegie and the Cove deal and the incline. Uh, you know, I was up the incline uh, to a restaurant up there a while back and that one of the guys at the table next door was like, hey, have you been to that theater over there? And, you know, it <laughs> generates that excitement of, um, of wanting to be part of something that is present. You know, we aren't about restoring over the run, we're about what's next for it. And uh, I think that that's, that's the great thing about theater is it's always right now and what's next as opposed to hindsight. Yeah, the really neat thing I think um, for us is just that, so our building is actually uh, a city of Covington building, right? So we are, we are a public assembly space for the last 115 or so years that the Carnegie has existed. Um, and so we try to take that legacy really seriously um, and, and kind of take that spirit of 
um, with, in which like it was, it was originally founded as a library, right? That anybody can walk in and find enrichment, um, that it is for any person of, of any stripe, of any income level, that you can come and have an experience that, you know, changes your mind, opens your mind, um, allows for learning to occur. Um, and so, you know, it's really amazing to walk in every morning and know that you're part of a century old legacy of people coming together. Um, and it's really hard right now because we can't do it. Um, but it is, it is an amazing story to tell um, about, you know, centuries of people coming together in the East Side neighborhood in Covington um, to learn from each other, to, to change, you know, their lives, their fortunes, or, or to come together for, you know, amazing moments of celebration um, in a public assembly space. Um, and there's magic to people coming together. We, we know it well um, and we miss it. And it'll be great when we can do it again. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I know that I'm personally missing the local theater experience around here, uh, as I'm sure so many others are. Um, but to touch more on what you, uh, all of you really mentioned is, is that integration with the community, the, the presentness of the space that you're in. Um, there, a lot of the times, especially choosing productions for a season, uh, Lynn, you mentioned, you know, being aware of local news and being cognizant of, of the communities that you're existing in. Um, there's kind of a balancing act between shows that we know are going to have a broad appeal and maybe newer works that um, are more in line with the mission or the message of the production company. Uh, what has been your experience and what do you see as the responsibility of the theater in choosing a season uh, and picking those shows? Uh, Lynn, would you mind starting on this one? No, I, I feel a, a really strong um, obligation and a strong responsibility. And again, it's part of where we are. Uh, and uh, 182 seats, you know, versus theaters that have six and 700 seats, you know, we should be able to take some chances here. What I have found is that ensemble audiences are different than audiences at other theaters I've worked with around the country. Uh, ensemble audiences are hungry for debate. They're hungry for discussing ideas. They want to talk about it after they leave. They, they don't simply come for entertainment, although sometimes we do things that are entertaining. It's not always terrible and sad and, uh, <laughs> depressing. It's not always that. In fact, uh, I'm missing right now prepping for every year we do this family friendly holiday musical that we commission and it's just a blast and you know all the kids get to come 2000 kids see it for free. So I'm really missing that I can't do that this year. Um, but I feel like if you can't take a chance in 182 seat theater and Cincinnati's over the line. Where are you going to do it? So we've been very, very fortunate, um, even in the dark days when we were trying to eliminate a budget that had accumulated before I got here. Uh, if, you know, you tried something. We tried something once that was just fun and people didn't like it. So um, it's fine if it's comedies that make sense. But, but if they're just for the sake of entertainment, that's not who we are. So I'm lucky. I'm really lucky. Sometimes you just get a show like Pipeline, which we're going to reopen with uh, when we come back. But, you know, you get a show where it all comes together and it's at the right moment. And sadly, that's at the right moment again. But I, I feel like there's even shows I would love to do that don't fit our mission. And there's shows I love seeing other places. Uh, but that's not why we're here and why we exist. And I think our audiences have been so loyal uh, based on that mission statement that we can be a little comfortable that at least what we're doing is is working most of the time and when we're open it works much better than when we're not it's <laughs> not 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 no income right now um, but no if you're a theater and you, you know, like Tim said so well at the beginning you know it's about now then you've got to bring what that community whatever that community is needs now not next year you know but you got to do it now so yeah it's a strong part of how I pick shows and, and programming that we even do on our second stage and in our education programs. Go, Mag. Yeah, Mag. Sure. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so, uh, right. So it's kind of a little bit about, you know, what, what, what does your community want, need, how, how do you serve those spaces, right? Um, personally, like, I come out of dance, right? That's my my primary discipline in the theater. Um, and so for me, it's really a lot about things that um, are musical. And we have a lot of people who want to see dance and musicals, even on our small stage, which I think is hilarious. Um, but we make it work. Um, sometimes we do extremely sort of immersive things that run through the aisles and off the balconies and, you know, kind of crazy, fun, exciting things um, that, that we can hopefully surprise people with. 
um, you know, we have a lot of diverse programming um, across the art gallery, the educational offerings. We do a lot of, uh, like we're a home for a lot of like lecture series and things like that. Um, so when it comes to our theater offerings, you know, I'm always trying to balance that. Um, I think we really have a reputation for musical theater. Um, and that can sometimes be an interesting place to program um, because only some of it, some of it is obviously very entertainment driven. Some of it is more issues driven. Um, and so, you know, trying to strike a balance so that I'm bringing both something that is transformative and, and asking questions as well as things that are for, you know, that night out where you just want to hear somebody like come out and sing an amazing thing. Or, you know, I just really want to, you know, see that big band and watch those dancers throw each other in the air, right? Um, so, you know, for us, there's sort of a place for all of these things. Um, I will say, you know, uh, certainly have faced a fair amount of backlash on any number of choices, um, uh, especially in the last few years, had some very vocal uh, persons who have come and maybe not enjoyed their show uh, based on its topics. Um, we don't necessarily let us, that deter us from our choices. Um, we, we want to hear those voices and we want to take that into account. Um, but we also want to make sure that, you know, those voices don't control the choices that we make um, and, that, and that we are bringing something that is for everyone across the course of the season. Um, and that's sort of a weird programming niche, honestly. Um, it's, it's hard necessarily to say we do all kinds of things, um, but really based on our mission, we're about the arts are for everyone. Everyone should be able to find a piece of programming at a price point that fits for them at the Carnegie. Um, it might not be every show, but it's definitely gonna be at least one. Um, and so we're gonna offer sort of that array of options across the season um, and, and not kind of just cater to one audience, no matter where they might be on the spectrum. Um, and again, that's just really mission driven. I have, I have a mandate you know, from the beginning of the Carnegie to kind of create that multifaceted offering. Okay, uh, our world. Um, as you know, we actually technically, you know, have many uh, pieces of Cincinnati Landmark Productions um, and, and a nearly 40 year history um, back in 1982 when we started our teen program and then that blossomed into our operation at the Showboat and now Covedale, Incline and and the MADCAP and MADCAP education. The point just being that you're going to segment a little bit here as to choices regarding programming, etc. cetera. Um, uh, certainly, I, I tend to think of Cincinnati Theater in general as like a radio dial. You know, I mean, you can go up and down the dial and hear whatever your taste may be, whether it, it is, you know, issue-driven uh, talk radio, or country or oldies or you know uh, uh, rock and roll whatever it is there is certainly a choice in each theater has to find a certain amount of how many of those stations or how much of that bandwidth do you want to cover uh, we certainly because of our history have, have been very much classic musicals classic comedies etc but that doesn't mean it's the only thing we've done um, certainly uh, with Covedale and Showboat those uh, those shows were chosen, especially Showboat. Showboat was chosen. Uh, the programming was always for a summary you know, experience on the Ohio River, often some sort of history. That does not mean, again, um, there wasn't uh, productions that have, you know, important or relevant messages. Uh, we, you know, you do Big River, and it's the musical version of Huckleberry Finn, but certainly uh, that show in and of itself, an extremely important message and, and obviously very germane till today and throughout the history when we've done the show and we did it twice down there, as a matter of fact, over our 23 years. Um, but you can do classic musicals, say like uh, uh, South Pacific, which really, you know, broached the subject of, of uh, important subjects on, on race and, and discrimination and prejudice. Uh, in a classic musical and maybe one of the most classic musicals, but you can also do, you know, we do White Castle, White Castle, White Christmas, we can do White Castle too, by the way, <laughs> White Christmas or the odd couples, what I was trying to say, because um, uh, they're just fun and they're, that's, that's part of what we do. Uh, but you got to, we, we know very well, we think about things like, say that at Madcap Education Center, we built a little 135 seat children's uh, theater in that space. It's meant for our puppet shows and our, you know, kids shows, etc. 
But when we run those shows at, at Madcap Education Center, uh, we have a four show weekend, two, uh, two matinees on Saturday, two matinees on Sunday. But the Friday or the Thursday before, depending on, on the timing, when we do that sort of, because that's when we open that show up, uh, when we do our final run-throughs, our final uh, uh, dress rehearsals, we're bringing kids from the uh, United Methodist Church School next door and Westwood Elementary across the street from Westwood Town Hall. And they get to see, you know, a puppet show uh, as our test audience. And uh, that's, you know, it's just part of the community of what we are and what we do. Um, we, we similarly have done that throughout, I think. Uh, lastly, you know, at, at Incline, we, we've had our trouble too, as Maggie was mentioning. We tried to define a summer experience at the Incline that was really a, a, uh, an, an heir, an inheritor from the showboat days. So a summery, fun, musical-based, comedy-based uh, summer stock season at the Incline. And then we have had heretofore um, uh, what we call the district series during the regular season, which were much more modern pieces with some often uh, uh, um, controversial content or just more modern content. Um, and uh, often those shows were still very, very famous uh, and we'll call them classic musicals like say Rent, but sometimes they uh, have been rather shocking, um, whether we were doing uh, uh, recently the, the puppet one, it all of a sudden escapes my brain. Um, it, we did a very adult puppet show, and the name, <laughs> I'm having a senior moment, forgot the title right now. But Hand to God, Dad. Hand, hand to God. Hand to God. Thank you. We did Hand to God, Hand Puppet, Hand to God. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Meg. I need you, Meg. Um, or, or, you know, Equus, et cetera, we've, uh, uh, Extremities, some very tough, tough issue uh, shows, um, but we knew right away that those were going to garner a much smaller audience. Uh, our musicals and, and our comedies have, have had a very large audience over the years, and um, it's just who we are uh, and who really, obviously, our, our patrons have responded to. But we also knew that to do other things that we wanted to do, it had better be scaled on a different size and different popularity. So we are a very populous theater, uh, but I think that's very much part of, of our identity. And our uh, there are ways still to make that both relevant and uh, outreached into the community. I couldn't agree more, and I, I love your your radio dial uh, metaphor in terms of there really is such a vast amount of offering in the greater Cincinnati area in terms of the variety of experiences you can look for. Um, but Maggie, uh, I want to go back to a statement that you made in this last question, uh, and before I do, I do want to remind our audience, if you have your own questions that you want to submit or come up with things uh, as we talk, please feel free to submit them in the chat. I'd be more than happy to moderate those as well. Uh, but Maggie, you, you said something about getting some, I guess, some backlash or maybe some negative okay. comments. Those aren't always the most fun responses that you get from your no. community, but it's incredibly important to have those interactions. And so my next question, if you wouldn't mind uh, leading this one off, where do you see your theater uh, in your space? Because it is, the Carnegie is a diverse art space uh, in terms of your offerings and, and the people that work with you. Um, where do you see those interactions and those intersections with the local community taking place? Uh, where do you see citizen input? Where do you see local sure. community member input? And, and how does that work for you guys? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, right. So, um, first and foremost is every time I get that call, that email, that whatever, um, I get into it. Um, I don't just let them pass. Um, I reach out to those people. I try to make a personal connection. Um, sometimes they, we come to a place where we understand each other better. Sometimes we come to a place that just says, well, you and I will not feel the same on this subject, and, and that's what it is. Um, but I do think it's important um, to cross that aisle and reach out um, and take each one of these with a sort of personal touch. Um, I call it, you know, the soft touch is really important at the Carnegie. Um, and when I say that, what I really mean is just interpersonal interaction. Um, I don't let the opportunity to meet with someone face to face, to have a phone call, um, to talk through something. Uh, if you 
call my office. If you leave me a message, I'm calling you back. If you're sending me an email and you have something to say, um, I'm inviting you to lunch. Um, I want to hear straight from people and, and forge that personal connection. Um, and I think honestly, that has really helped me not only navigate, you know, this job, this organization, um, and, and certainly I think it's a hallmark of who we are, right? Like we're about the face to face. Um, and at the end of the day, like it's, it's something that has helped me throughout this entirety of the pandemic. Um, you know, we kind of all, I'm sure have ebbed and flowed on our like, okay, today I feel okay. Today I'm going to be underneath this blanket. Um, but what I really kind of came to a couple months ago was just that I'm, I'm a people person. I need people. Um, and I started just reaching out to people. I started reaching out personally and saying, this is the situation of our theater. This is the situation of the arts. Um, and overwhelmingly, people said, I want to help. What can I do to help? Um, and so we, we're actually launching an initiative that will come out this week, um, which is a new sort of committee-based programming initiative that's open to literally anyone um, who at this time is seeking creative community and a space to um, find a way for live performance in a socially distant world in ways that are safe, in ways that are innovative. Um, and what it really became about was a way to connect more readily with stakeholders, to bring them into the center of what I'm doing um, and not just have them be people that when they reach out to me, well then, okay, now we can have that conversation, but rather to create a formalized standing invitation for the public to step into our space whether that's metaphorically or on Zoom or in real life, um, and say, this is what I want from my neighborhood theater. Um, this is what I want as an artist from my neighborhood theater. Um, and instead of me taking the reins all the time of saying, this is what the programming will be, and then going out to hire people about it, um, our new tack will basically be more of a, a crowdsourcing model where artists come to us and we put whatever resources we can around them um, in this time when you know everybody is so in need of connection. Um, and, and I understand your question was kind of more about how we do that in before this moment. Um, but I think this is coming out of, um, like the creation of this committee is coming out of a long history of personal, interpersonal connections um, and really expecting every staff person at the Carnegie to take the time for that face-to-face -face moment to hear out people when they want to communicate with us and to reach out to the social service organizations, um, NKCAC, um, Center for Great Neighborhoods. Uh, like we are the arts providers for the schools, uh, the independent school district of Covington, right? Um, so we are making those personal touches. You won't see it all the time in our marketing or on our website, um, but we are doing the work in a one-to-one -one fashion. Um, and that's really what we're about. Yeah. Hey, I had to step out. I missed the question. Oh. Michael, your microphone is off. Of course it is. It's, <laughs> one of the one of the new realities that I'm getting used to is constantly flipping on and off. Um, so we were talking about the ways in which you see your theater and your arts community intersecting with local communities. And, and local citizens, where, where do you see uh, the populations around you having a voice or, or influencing uh, your art space? Um, I, particularly with us, it has always been through various community organizations. Um, we've been involved from the beginning in, in each uh, area with, whether it's in Westwood with Westwood Works or Westwood Con uh, civic Club or the West, Westwood Historical Society. The Westwood has a lot of civic organizations. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, uh, the folks that we're intersecting with then are very involved in the neighborhood in general, or the businesses around us, uh, or the schools, again. Um, we have a great relationship with Westwood Town Hall, uh, Westwood School, the, I'm talking about Westwood at the moment, uh, uh, again, the UMC Church across the street. Uh, we do a lot of uh, outreach and, and communication and work back and forth. Um, uh, we're always pretty much involved with each other. Um, we're currently at like in Incline Public. You were talking about Incline Public, the restaurant, Lynn. Um, uh, you know, th there's hopefully a business opportunity there because we hope to do some outdoor concerts this summer. 
and uh, having them as part of it uh, makes their business better. And uh, we're hoping to essentially use the same programs as they have it over the Rhine, where we can take a piece of street that's right in front of the theater and make that uh, a, a performance space. Now we've done uh, um, neighborhood parties there in the past, which have been great, just free for the neighborhood. Uh, we bring in the Mystics. You guys know the Mystics, the, the greatest vocal band ever. That's, I love those guys because they're 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 a set of brothers and they're a lot of fun. But uh, I actually met them on Fountain Square years ago when I used to host uh, the Mayor's Light Up the Square ceremony, and they always sang. But my point is that we bring in them. We bring in My Cincinnati, which is the youth orchestra on in East Price Hill. Uh, that's based on La Sistema, if I say that correctly. Um, anyway, we bring in them and they've played for that. Uh, but uh, those kind of street fairs and stuff are a great way to get connection. And then um, uh, in general, I, I feel like we're great, great neighbors. I mean, we're very involved in every way in, in all our little areas. Uh, Glenway is certainly very much a business district, uh, but our business neighbors are, are very, very important to us. Uh, there certainly is plenty of, of neighborhood folks and we know them and they know us as well. Um, I mean, it's a dumb example. And I, I know I, my experience is going to be different than their experiences in, based on neighborhoods, et cetera. Um, since the shutdown of everything, uh, the, there's a, we, we actually are in charge of the entire block of the Incline Theater as far as maintenance, grass cutting, all that stuff. Well, we, of course, can't afford a grass cutter. So I've been cutting the grass. And um, uh, there's a large fence around the section where the neighbors, you know, park. And uh, underneath that section, I couldn't get the mower. So the grass was growing up very tall. And uh, I came back to cut the grass the other day and all that had been cut. So some neighbor of mine said, oh, that poor old man trying to cut that grass. They just cut the grass for us. Um, we have done things for our neighbors and they have done things for the, for, for us many a time. Uh, we've been very, very blessed that way. So uh, for us, uh, we're very neighbor based, but we're also very, very, again, neighborhood uh, organization based. We, we attend meetings at the East Price Hill Improvement Association and we go to Westwood Works and we go through uh, our business neighbors as well and uh, West Price Hill Community Council, uh, et cetera. Those are where we hook into the neighborhood we talk to them and they talk to us. I, I spoke at a, a Western breakfast, a Western group breakfast the other day of various groups. And um, what it was frightening because they love us so. <laughs> They're so proud and so thrilled that uh, as part of uh, the organizations that we work with that are about you know making a good life for the people who live in these neighborhoods, that we're involved with them and, and we do what we do. So uh, I feel like we've made a strong connection and we're doing good things that way. And that may or may not be exactly the question you asked, but that's where I went. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll follow you there. And uh, it is about, you know, it is about that relationship. You know, it'll be our 26th year uh, coming up in December of doing expectations of Christmas for Tender Mercies because I found out about Tender Mercies, which was right across the back alley from us and around the corner because one of our founders left her purse on the front door back in, you know, back in those days. And somebody from Tender Mercies found it and knew it wasn't where it belonged. So they went knocking on doors to find out how to return it. And that's how I learned about Tender Mercies. You know, I've learned about these organizations in our neighborhood a day at a time. And, you know, there's more of them now and there's also more businesses and so many independently owned businesses down here. So, you know, when you have some trouble or you have unrest, everybody shares plywood, everybody, you know, everybody comes to each other's aid. Uh, and it's a very tenacious neighborhood now. Um, things change dramatically since 01. Um, since 01, it started. And it's really taken the better part of 19 years to get to where it is now. But then you have setbacks and then you have crisis. I mean, right now, one of the things that was an immediate reaction to the Black Lives Matter movement was, you know, my amazing scenic artist, uh, Rachel Kuhn, who's a furloughed, you know, called and said, can I do some portraits for the windows? I'm like, of course. So there's four beautiful portraits that she painted over a period of two days 
uh, of people that had died at the hands of violence and uh, from the police. And then uh, Shannon, our props master and director of our intern company, uh, went and wrote quotes from black authors and from shows we produced. And it's that idea of you, know, you have a window, so let's be part of the neighborhood. And um, you hand out you hand out water bottles and you hand out masks and you know you do what you have to do to make sure people know that you are part of the movement forward as opposed to the protective idea of going backwards and and uh nothing about theaters about the rearview mirror it's just not and uh i think that in that moment that's one thing in the moment of us trying to rebuild i gotta tell you i mean businesses are dependent now uh, on what we what our theaters produce that is it is about capacity it's about creativity and uh, everything's changed you know the week after we closed I was ready to announce next season well it's going to be a very different season a uh, very different season because we're now in a very different world than we ever were before my mom keeps saying I don't remember anything like this and I'm like that's because there's never been anything like this you know uh, in her 80 year lifetime so it's um you know, it's, it is about being able to not only react, but respond. And I think that's what all of these, uh, these other Perino organizations and things do. Because, you know, when I saw what happened with Madcap, that building, and when I saw what you guys are doing there, it just, oh, it makes me so happy because there's just, suddenly you're driving up Harrison Avenue and there's light where there was just darkness, where there was just this beautiful, sad looking building. And it reminded me so much of down here, you know? I mean, the block, now we're 40% of the block, but it was just a dark block. And now it's lit up and you go up Harrison and that's lit up and you go up Glenway and there's light. And it uh, light draws people in a good way to come together. And I, I feel that, that these theaters are a very healing influence on the community. And certainly I think given the fact that we're in a pandemic, you know, we have a responsibility to be kind and gentle in the reopening phases, doing it safely and, um, and doing it with a sense of, you know, making sure people are ready and willing to come out so that our bottom lines may be suffering and our, our staff may be in trouble, but, but it doesn't solve it to suddenly throw your doors open and say, okay, everybody take a shot and come in. That's, that's not the way to do that. I, if I could uh, piggyback a little bit on that, yeah, we what we've been thrilled about is again being part of the success of a neighborhood for its future, as I've said. So, um, one of the things we we often talk about in presentations is the fact that, uh, and and it's and it's coincidental. It's not that we caused this, but we are part of this surge, as it were, uh, where things like a Vera Cruz restaurant comes in over on Price Avenue, about two blocks up from us, and the Psalm Wine Bar, and the Incline Public House, and the Prima Vista, which has been there forever, and now the Block Coffee House has moved in right behind the theater. Um, uh, uh, Pablo, you know, we, we call him now, he caters most things we do uh, over from Vera Cruz. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I, I'm sure when he started, he didn't know what the reception would be. And, and uh, we, we just want to be part of his success and, and, and all those areas. Uh, the two restaurants across the street from the Incline, uh, which Incline Public and Prima Vista, Prima Vista has been there a while. But uh, in the five years that we've been there, each successive year has been their best year ever. Now that we're, we're part of that. Obviously, we're bringing 225 people there a night, and they go to dinner before, or they have drinks after, et cetera. Right now, that's a big fat minus. That's my dog, see my doggy. Uh, so my point just being again, uh, uh, the our neighborhoods are gonna, our, we're missing our neighborhoods, our neighborhoods I think are missing us. Absolutely, Tim, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Maggie, I know that area so well where the Carnegie is, and I know that you, you're doing the same with your neighbors. You know, we look at Micah, we look at Taste of Belgium, we look at Bakersfield, we look at all these, you know, tables that would normally be filled and will be again, but I'm sure it's like that. I, I, know, I know from the years of talking to people over in, in that neighborhood how important the Carnegie is as far as, as really drawing people together and drawing people out, you know, getting them away from Netflix, right? 
Yeah, I hope so. Uh, it's it's always a challenge, isn't it? And, and certainly I, I love my Netflix and my couch, so I, I feel those people. Um, but yeah, actually, you know, what's great about being a part of a neighborhood is, you know, the when the dance team can't rehearse at the VFW, they're, hey, can we rehearse at the theater? Sure, we got you, no problem. Um, you know, we wanna hold a meeting about Randolph Park. Yeah, we, we got you there too. Um, it's nice to have resources to be able to help people. Um, I'm a big like yes person. I love to say yes. I love to, you know, if there's something I can do or serve or provide, I legitimately light up inside to do it. Um, so it's a really nice thing to have really close ties with the people around us um, and know that, you know, this giant edifice that, you know, could be just another sort of empty building on a street corner, right? Instead, it's this incredibly vibrant space that really can be of service um, to the people who live immediately around us, as well as other, you know, small arts groups and, and community groups. Um, so it's really like our heart's desire to like put the building to work for other people. Um, and it's amazing that, you know, again, we get to get up and do it every day. Um, maybe not as much right now, but most of the time, right? I, I love that point. And I think that um, we actually do have some questions coming in and I wanna make sure that I'm addressing those, uh, especially as we are kind of nearing the end of the time we had uh, allotted for this. Um, so I wanna address those. Uh, and it looks like they're kind of coming from two places that are lining up well with questions that I already had. So I wanna make sure that um, I'm addressing their questions. Um, you know, you mentioned serving and, and saying yes and, and uh, being you know, active in your community. Um, that's often a two-way street. Um, so a, a lot of people I know right now want to get more involved and uh, they want to know how the theater plans on continuing in the future and how they can be a part of that. I know especially uh, I hear a lot from students that are in theater that want to get involved, um, are interested in being active. So I guess um, as a two-part question to kind of close up, um, one, how are you adapting currently and how do you see things moving in the future? Uh, Facebook Live, Twitter Live, you know, ways of being present. Tim, you had mentioned before we began about your virtual experiences that you're entering into now. And then um, how can people on the other side be part of that experience? How can they give back? How can they continue to participate in theater during this time and in the future? Um, I know that's pretty broad, so please uh, answer it however you, however you like. Um, Tim, do you mind starting on this one? Uh, sure. Real quick, I'll throw out some things. We, we especially with our Madcap uh, touring operation, so many of the summer uh, touring shows got canceled uh, or they just can't uh, perform and they're prepaid. <laughs> so uh, we uh, did go into a, a virtual model. Um, luckily, in the MADCAP Education Center, we built a distance learning room, and in that room, we have the ability to do like like we do on Zoom with background changes and stuff like that. So we have been doing those shows when we can as a virtual show to the person who's already paid the fee, as it were. But uh, you know, the hard part about that is is that our live in-person touring production costs a and um, our virtual shows only cost B, and B is about a third of what A is. So technically we'll do a show for someone who's already paid if we still owe them two thirds of the money back. So virtual is not the uh, be all and end all right away. And of course, just in general, long term, uh, it, it, it A isn't as, as uh, financially supportive and B, it just ain't the same as going and sharing an experience with a bunch of people together in a theater. But certainly we are trying to find our way there as best we can. Um, as far as uh, two other things you kind of mentioned, one is, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, I know Lynn is in the paper today uh, with uh, some of the other folks in town. And uh, it just bespeaks again what I think we, I've been saying with my board and other people, uh, and even at that breakfast I spoke about the other day, we're going to get small. We're not going, we're already looking at uh, our usual model. I mean, we had to cancel our whole summer season of big musicals and 20 people dancing. Well, we had to cancel that altogether, and we might be able to do some small concert stuff outdoors this summer. And then if and when we're allowed to, 
we're going to do smaller shows with fewer actors and shows that could be consported on 33% of an audience because we have created the pods inside of our theaters uh, that are only using a third of the seats so that we can socially distance correctly. Um, so we're going to get small and we're going to get through and someday, thanks to uh, medical science, um, we'll be allowed to grow again. And we'll probably have to go slow with that even, but uh, smartly, uh, we'll grow again. And so if what people can do, help us grow again, whether it's number one, when we're back online, or even these smaller things we do now, come, come, please. Buy a drink at the concession stand, buy a ticket, if you are uh, able to certainly donate or in-kind services are greatly appreciated. If you're a volunteer, that's gonna be very huge. Uh, for example, we're talking about these outdoor concert things for us this summer. If we do these, and we're still waiting on approvals from the city, uh, we're not gonna be able to staff it, not like we used to. There'll be a staff person there or two, but we're gonna need volunteers. And we're going to need somebody who's literally as dedicated to the furthering of this art form through this crisis as the staff might be. And uh, if they're wanting a career, I, I, my point would be, while we're small, volunteerism is huge. And hopefully that puts you in position later when we are growing again. Uh, I saw a thing this, this weekend where somebody said, uh, uh, if you can volunteer at a nonprofit and, 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 and be passionate about it, in three years, you can run the thing. <laughs> and they're not wrong. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> volunteerism, uh, dedicated volunteerism tends to lead to uh, dedicated uh, professional service. Um, so th that's where I, I, I come at the, the rather, uh, what I discerned as three parts of the question. Maggie, you want to go? Yeah, perfect. I'll go. Um, yeah, so um, I, I see the comment about uh, Facebook or Twitter and mini productions, and, and absolutely, that, that's something that can be done. Lots of people are doing it. Um, I think it's a great outlet. Um, most of the people who are monetizing it are doing it through um, sort of like Patreon or Venmo sort of chip jar kind of things. Um, it's if you're if you're going on Facebook or Twitter, there isn't a way to sort of like charge for a ticket per se um, in that kind of format. Um, but there are, of course, you know, other services, whether it's unlisted, you know, YouTube spaces or it's Vimeo, where you could be using that to do a more monetized version um, of direct, you know, digital video kind of pieces. Um, I am, of course, yeah, like I'm with all every, you know, there's such a dichotomy because the digital stuff is like super important. And of course, it's part of where the future is for theater and especially, you know, we don't know what the other side of this looks like, right? I want to believe that I can, you know, go back to my thing, um, but that might not be the case, right? There will be lasting change that occurs in this time that we take with us into whatever is next. Um, so I'm trying to just be really open about whatever that is. Um, adaptation is our, is our greatest friend at this point. Um, and so for me, right, like, Theater is about that existential, ecstatic feedback loop, right? It's about when the, the actor sees the audience and the audience reacts in real time and then it informs how the actor does the rest of their show, right? Um, and the heart's beating in time and the laughing with the person next to you and you know, all that stuff is just, uh, that's where it's at for me. So I have a hard time um, thinking about virtual offerings as like a, as a main course. Um, I definitely think it's needed, um, especially because accessibility is going to become more important than ever. Um, in the next 12 months, how we're able to serve people who can't get out of their homes or necessarily come out and gather, that has to be a part of our strategy. That has to be part of, of what's going on. Um, we can't just leave those people behind. But at the same time, um, what we've really kind of taken to is this idea of um, there are ways to have live experiences. They might be different. They might be structurally different um, than what people are used to doing. I walk in the door, I give the usher my ticket, I sit in my seat. Um, okay, well, how can we flip these things so that, you know, there isn't a seat, there isn't a ticket, 
Um, you never even walked in this door necessarily, right? But the show came to your to your front yard, or the show came to uh, you know we're working with Pyramid Hill right now on a really it's a sculpture park in Hamilton for anybody who doesn't know um, on a, a on presenting a a true book musical but in a crazy broken down format across three acres of park. Um, we're talking with, or we're working on a program where we have two man actor groups going out to um, homes for folks with cognitive disabilities. They've been isolated this whole time. Um, their slate of activities canceled. Um, the only people they see are the, are the DSPs coming to their house. Um, so this is a really great program to help with that kind of isolation. It also allows us to pay actors for some gig work that they can actually you know, safely do. There's no rehearsal. There's one sort of Zoom overview. Um, we meet with the, the people at the homes to, to find out what they want and what they need. Um, we craft a small 35 minute piece around that and then they just show up and do it. Um, and we're doing it in masks and we're doing it in their front yards and in their backyards. And um, these are the kind of things that we're, we're kind of interested in. How can we create new structures um, how can we create a walking based theatrical through the entirety of our, our giant building that you experience one actor at a time in a no more than three or four person group walking through. Um, so I'm really interested in, in I, I'm a big structured person in general. Um, half the time I'm like, well, the content is whatever. How are we doing the structure? Um, so it's been really fun, honestly, um, and kind of exciting um, not to just think about like, okay, what's the next season? What's the next show I'm putting up? Let me do all the things I normally do. I, I love doing the things I normally do. I, I want to do them again. Um, but taking this time to like just blow up the paradigm and think about a million new experiences we could create um, again, it's helping me find agency. It's helping me find hope and excitement in a time that's a little bit lacking that. Uh, I completely agree, Maggie. And you know, that enthusiasm for what's next is, is intoxicating. You know, it, 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 you have to have that kind of passion and that hope in order to get up and figure out what the next day is. And, uh, you know, we have, we have 600 children a week we work with in the schools with autism. So how do you take this form and connect with them. So, you know, it was a strong investment in the education programming, making sure that those staff stayed tired and that we started there. And then um, every Friday at noon from now on, there's gonna be a lunch, like with no food. You can have your own food in your own Zoom room. Uh, but, you know, we, we open that up to our subscribers for discussion and ideas. And uh, that's sort of been, been great. And then Thursday nights at seven, uh, starting next week again, we'll have, we have an, a, a Meet the Artist, which is live on Facebook and anybody can join into that. And it's really been fun to meet some of the actors, the sound designers, the technicians, you know, some of these people that, that uh, make it work. And uh, we are planning to, uh, we lost two shows last year, Totally Photograph 51, 20th Century Blues. So we are hoping to record those and send those out either as an audio or a Zoom, but that takes money, you know? <laughs> so we're seeing how we can do that, but we owe so much to our patrons who've been with us loyally. So boy, that switch had to flip fast. You know, there was no time to sit around and think, hmm, I wonder what we'll do in October. When we closed in March, I thought we'd be back in May. You know, I was just so wrong. So, um, you know, making the mistakes of being too optimistic has been, um, it's also been a driving force to, to get really, really creative. And uh, it's really cool to me that, that, uh, that you know, that, that we'll be back in January with Pipeline. Other people are opening sooner, but 182 seats would be down to 35 seats safely. And I can't do that. And I don't want, the last thing I want to do is, as I said before, push people back until I can open them with, uh, welcome them with open arms. And uh, whether it's a mask or not, you know, we just want to make sure that we say thank you to everybody who's been so supportive. And I, I gotta say, I mean, Thomas Moore taught, uh, taught us, I think, all well, which was, you know, there was never a great deal of stuff to make art with. It wasn't about, you know, I mean, I, I directed a show up at CCM a few years ago and I'm like, oh my gosh, it was like so much fancier than ensemble, you know? Um, but, you know, Thomas Moore was like, think on your feet and serve your community and have a conscience. And uh, I, I do think that's inspired, certainly I know it's inspired my life, but I also think it's inspired my work uh, tremendously. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, as another uh, Thomas More theater student, as uh, several of us here are, I, I, I couldn't agree more with that statement. It really was an amazing experience to do theater here and to, to take the lessons of that back out into our communities. I, I think it's influenced all of us. 
Um, I, I couldn't thank you guys enough for being here today. Thank you so much for sharing your message. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you for everything you do in our community. Um, as you all can see in the chat, they have included contact links for each of their uh, production companies and their theaters. Uh, if you want to get in touch with them, we will provide that information on the link. Again, there is a recording of this, so if you want to share this with other people, please go out and do so and stay involved in local theater. Stay enthusiastic about local theater. I'm sure, as we can see from today, local theater is staying enthusiastic about all of you. So thank you all again, and uh, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you next time on another More Talks. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.